Welcome to PeopleForce Podcast by Trinet. I'm your host, Michael Mendenhall. Trinet is a full-service HR solutions company committed to empowering small to medium-sized businesses by supporting their growth and enabling their people. We work with amazing small to medium-sized businesses, and I'm excited to bring their voices here to life. You can catch new episodes of People Force Podcast every month on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and rise.trinet.com. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Happiest Baby co-founder and CEO, Dr. Harvey Karp. Dr. Harvey Karp is one of America's most trusted pediatricians and child development experts, known for his innovative techniques in helping parents soothing fussy babies and improving sleep. I could have used some of this. He is the creator of the happiest baby on the block method, a groundbreaking approach to calming newborns and infants. Dr. Karp's 2002 book, Happiest Baby on the Block, revolutionized caring for babies. His book has sold millions of copies in dozens of languages and has spent two decades being celebrated on the parenting bestsellers list. He is the assistant professor of pediatrics at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California and a founding board member of Healthy Child, Healthy World. Harvey and his wife, Nina Karp, founded Happiest Baby in 2001. Their focus on helping solving everyday parenting challenges includes science-based products, content and services that enhance a child's well-being. Happiest Baby was named one of Fast Company's most innovative companies in 2020. Their flagship product and smash success, Snoo, is the world's first smart sleeper for infants. It reduces a baby's crying, aids their sleep, and most importantly, helps prevent sudden infant death syndrome, saving lives. Dr. Karp's lifelong dedication to improving the lives of children and families has made him a leading authority in the field of pediatric medicine and child development. He has appeared on numerous television shows, including The Oprah Winfrey Show, Dr. Phil, The View, and has been featured in many publications, including Time Magazine, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. Harvey, thank you for being here. Thanks, Michael. Great to see you again. Yes. So we want to go all the way back because you know, when did you believe you were going to go in the field of medicine and life sciences? Because uh, did you know that uh, as you were growing up? Did somebody influence you or mentor you or you just really took to like science early on? Well, I completely didn't know what I was doing. There were no doctors in my family. My father was an engineer uh, and he worked for himself. And I thought that is so cool if you could make your own hours and design your life the way you want it to be, not have to be a cog in a, in a big company. Um, but I didn't really like engineering very much. I liked science. So I thought biology, I could be a doctor. Doctors work for themselves. I had no clue how complex the world of medicine is and how once you're committed as a doctor, you are, you are, you know, basically uh, working for thousands of people. You have your own <laughs> life. You have thousands of bosses um, that you're that you're uh, responding to. So anyway, it was a good choice, but completely, um, I lucked out completely. So you do then probably in high school, hey, this is the path. This is this is what I'm going to go do. Once I started college, yeah. Yeah. And, and so where did you go? And when you got into it, was there ever a moment where you thought, no, this is too much. Maybe not, no, not so much. Maybe I do something else. Was there ever any hesitation, you know? No, in, no, 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 no. I really loved it. I was a duck in, a duck in water. Uh, or fish and water, or whatever they say. Yeah. Um. I I was uh, really loved it. I was constantly challenged by it, so it was a good choice. And, and where did you go? Uh, University of Buffalo, in New York. Buffalo. And and did did you get your your doctorate there? I got my bachelor's there, and then I went to medical school at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, in New York City. Oh, awesome! So, so now here you are. Um, you chose the field being a pediatrician. Um, tell us why and was that easy and did it become more complicated than you had thought? Well, I would say, um, actually, when I went to medical school, I loved everything. I wanted to be a surgeon. I wanted to be a neurologist. <laughs> I wanted to be an ophthalmologist. 
I liked everything. All the areas were interesting to me, but what really struck me about pediatrics was that um, children got healthy. They were strong. It was a very optimistic field. Um, it's very um, somber when you're working with, um, at least for me, it was working with the elderly. For some people, they don't like working with children because it can be so shocking and sad when children get ill. And of course, that that's very much the truth. Um, but uh, for me, working with parents and working with young children, I remember when I was uh, uh, in the Bronx uh, doing rounds on a on a Saturday morning, and these kids with sickle cell anemia and cancer, they were like bouncing in their cribs to Soul Train, which was on the televisions. <laughs> and they had such spirit, and their parents had such optimism that that really was uh, was the area that I wanted to work in. Now. I'm going to guess because with children, you also have the parents. So uh -huh. you have the extended family um, as well. Um, was that very different for you? You know, you could be a surgeon, you know, working with adults. You're dealing with mainly, you know, the adult uh, patient. When you're with children, you're dealing with family. Um, talk to us about the difference there and did you have to adapt, or is that something you sort of love, the social piece of uh, working in pediatrics? Well, it was for me, it was wonderful. Of course, in any field, when you're working with a patient, you've got to work with their family as well, but never as intimately as in pediatrics. Um, but um, I love teaching, and it's really mentoring is really part of being a pediatrician. I like to joke that my job is half being a doctor and half being a grandmother, because a lot of the things that parents needed to know weren't really medical per se. They were good common sense and ancient wisdom, things that were carried on. But many parents today are separated from their extended family. Um, they, they don't have the richness of that support that every other generation of human beings had until maybe 100 years ago. And so the pediatrician's role is really one of support and common sense and, and kind of passing on grandparenting-like tips in addition to medical advice. So did you become a professor before you founded your company, um, or was it the opposite? No, I was, a, I was an assistant professor for many, many years at UCLA and then uh, USC in Los Angeles. So that was really... It, at the same exact time as I started in practice. So I did that for about 20 years, teaching in the hospitals, et cetera. And actually uh, being in the, in the office in my business, I, have, I don't have the time to be teaching the way I used to. So, so I want to now enter Nina, your wife. Mm -hmm. um, where did you meet her? And then uh, you wound up getting married uh, and you have a company together. So I want to talk about where she entered the picture um, and and then how you developed a company as husband and wife, because sometimes that can be tricky, because what we do know is that most small businesses fail due to co-founder right uh, issues. And so um, talk to us about where she came in and when you decided to form the company. Well, we met 30 years ago at a party. She was coming down the stairs. I was coming up the stairs. And and just started a conversation, and uh, and it was it was magical. You know, it, what's the extraordinary thing is sometimes in your life you meet people, and you just remember that moment forever. You won't remember what you ate for lunch two days ago, but you remember this moment in time. That's when you know it's it's special. So that was quite a while ago, and we've had many many enterprises together since then. So we've learned how to work together. You know, the joke in in our family is you know. Divorce, never murder, maybe. <laughs> we, both, we both have passions and we have very strong opinions. Um, but what is perfect in our dynamic is that um, I really, you know, have an expertise in the science um, and she has an expertise in everything. I mean, she raised <laughs> our funds and hired our executive team and found our factories in China and India and um, designed our our offices and 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 built an office in Europe, our second office there. She's just extraordinary. She knows no fear. She has incredible capabilities and that common sense that leads you because you're always in a business. You you know there's there are options. 
there are decisions you have to be make to make and um and sometimes you can get lost in all of those decisions and if you have an inner um an inner sense of what's right it really helps to guide you and she is brilliant in that way well let's go then to happiest babies where mm-hmm. you're, you're you're both working you're both executives there um Talk to me about why you formed it, what the mission and purpose is of the company, um, and and its intent long term. Well, we like to joke we're not a company with a mission. We're a mission with a company because we were already retired when we started this company. And we're not roboticists, we're not startup, you know, um, you know, MBAs from from Harvard who always want to have a startup. Um, it was really because of the deaths in the United States that motivated us. I was giving a lecture about uh, SIDS or infant sleep death, saying that 3,500 babies die every year in the United States, healthy babies, babies who shouldn't die. And no change in the last 20 years. Every year, 3,500, 3,500. And I said, if, if another country were killing 3,500 of our babies, we would go to war. I mean, there's nothing we would stop at to, to prevent that from happening. Why weren't we doing more? And I went back to the to the um, the hotel room that night and I said to Nina, you know, I think we can do something about this. Would you do it with me? Um, she said, how long do you think it'll take? I said, a year, year and a half. How hard could this be? Um, this was 11 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and she had just made a documentary on healing from breast cancer. It was brilliant. Actually, I think it's one of the best documentaries on on illness that I've ever seen called uh, The Path of Wellness and Healing. And um, I said, listen, I just helped you with that project. Will you help me with this project? And she said, sure. And so we started out, you know, raised some funds and, and started building prototypes. And actually, my first partner my first business partner um, in this was a professor at MIT Media Lab, a super um, bright and experienced roboticist. And so together we started pulling the team together. And the goal was really, as odd as this sounds, to put me in every baby's bedroom in the country. You know, So what would I do in terms of calming a baby if I were there to be able to pick up the baby? And how could we build that into a machine that didn't look like a machine. That's a beautiful poetic um, design, but that nevertheless had the functionality of a caregiver because this was really the nut of it, Michael. The American family and families all around the world now are really suffering and struggling because of a certain disintegration of the extended family. Of course, a number one concern is parents are exhausted when they have a baby. It's really a struggle for them. But underlying that concern is the fact that they don't have their mother, their sister, their grandmother, their next door neighbor's older daughter constantly in the house with them, helping them because that's the way it used to be. Um, And so parents are struggling without that help and they don't even think they deserve it. They think, oh, a normal mom and dad or parents just do it on their own. Um, And so what we're trying to do is give an underpinning, a support for the family extra sleep for the baby, reduce the crying, sleep train the baby, most importantly, keep the baby secured so they cannot roll to an unsafe position because that's when so many of the deaths occur. And we're thrilled. We actually, on top of all the work we've done, and we've measured 500 million hours of infant sleep to prove our points. We're now in 160 hospitals supporting the nursing staff and supporting parents in the hospital but we just got FDA approval as the very first bed uh, in the world that is proven safe and effective for keeping babies in that safe position. So it's been a very busy oh, big, big congratulations busy on that because that's not easy. Thanks. <laughs> no, no that's, that that's, was that's... a real, a real challenge. Yeah. Let's go back to the funding piece <laughs> in in the businesses that that you and and Nina have have produced and made and, and, and taken to market. How many of those did you struggle getting funding? Like people were like, you're doing what? And how's this going to work? And, you know, you need so much capital up front to do this. And, you know, you're not going to have the supply chain that you talked about earlier, where you're in China, you're here, you're there, where you can, you know, mass produce things at, at a reasonable cost. What was that like? 
Well, in, a, in prior enterprises, we funded everything. It was always bootstrapped. So we this was a first experience to work with VCs and and really have a board of directors and and things that you don't have to have when you have a normal small business and it's just you know a husband and wife team. Um, or I had a small pediatric practice with a few partners. So that that funding side of it never entered into it. Um, again, pick the right partner. You know, my my wife has uh, has great abilities, uh, persuasion, and she's extremely charismatic. And and our idea made sense. Listen, no one even thought that you could accomplish what we've accomplished. No one thought that babies could sleep longer. We say, yeah, I know they're babies. They have to wake up. Some babies just cry a lot. And yet there's this magical thing that doctors tell families when they're really struggling, which is that, you know what? There is a way to immediately help babies sleep longer and cry less, drive them all night in the car. And when you go, well, that yes, works, yes. Even, right? I mean, if you fall asleep in trains and planes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we knew that there was a way. And, and my work, because I wrote a book 20 years ago that described a new approach to giving parents the skills, call happiest baby on the block, give parents the skills to be much more competent at taking care of their babies. Anyone can learn these skills and be the best baby comer who ever lived with <laughs> with some very simple um, techniques. Um, and then I wrote happiest toddler on the block. So how do you raise a toddler with, again, very simple techniques that are counterintuitive but can immediately change the dynamic and help you be more competent um, by doing the tricks that preschool teachers and pediatricians learn along the way. So um, so then we, we you know, decided to do this. We had to raise funds and bring on an extended team and bring on experts in fields of operations and uh, manufacturing and product development and industrial design and uh, legal and all of the other areas, marketing, that are really required to build a team that's going to allow you to be successful because our goal wasn't just, could we make a little baby bed that we could sell and people would like it? Our goal is to completely restructure the sociologic underpinnings of our society and the societies around the world to be able to support all families and support them for free. And we'll get to that in a minute. Yes. And to go into hospitals and to be able to support nursing staffs in hospitals globally all around the world. Well, so let let's talk about that. You you brought up the the free piece. You you've had major best selling books, um, and and it's not just about the sudden infant death syndrome, but it's really about the caring of mm -hmm. children, um, right. behaviorally as well. Um, talk to us about those books because they they're I, you have them in multiple languages all around the world. Number one, still best selling a book for. Uh, child rearing. Uh, talk to us about that because there's lots of pieces in that that you can probably obtain free. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And we have millions of people who come to our website every month just for free information. We've got tons and tons of information about babies and toddlers. And Can you, can you to interrupt, uh, give us the URL right now so that people know where to go to actually access that info? Yeah, you bet. Anyone can come to happiestbaby.com. Of course, we're on Instagram as well and Twitter and Facebook, but but we have this this treasury of 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 knowledge for anyone to come and take advantage of at happiestbaby.com. So um, so everyone's welcome to come and join videos that help to explain things as well. Because again, we're in the in the education business, and there's something about commerce, Michael. And I'm sure you've seen this before, and you're you know a world's expert in marketing yourself. Um, Commerce today is about relationships. It's about authority and authenticity and about showing that you care about your customers, not just because you want to sell them things, but because you want to be part of their lives. And that's really uh, something I know that, that you do at Trinet. Um, it's important not just to be, you know, selling a product, but really to that's the whole purpose of this podcast is to to share, and I'm so appreciative of Tri uh, Trinet for wanting to share these stories with others to to hopefully inspire and educate, and that's what we do as well. Yeah, well, we we you know at Trinet really are a part of your company. We'll <laughs> we'll talk about how you assemble a team, keep them there, 
uh, retain them, keep them energized, and focused on actually doing your business. And and we look at it as we're a part of your success. Uh, your success is ours, and um, and your stories are our stories. Uh, and we we impact that in a major way. So why don't we we pivot to that? You were talking about you know a key person from MIT Media Labs, but you were talking about you know manufacturing. You're talking about product design, legal, et cetera. How did you begin to assemble a team? And did you look for people who had the same passion around your ideas um, and and what you wanted to do really for society? relative to infants and children? You know, one of the things when you work with people, to build a culture, you have to have a shared value system. And what's wonderful in our type of a business is that people get the idea of saving babies' lives. It's an easy one to say, oh my God, I can work in a company that saves babies' lives. Um, that's our hope and goal. We, we're we we're working on that. That's what the FDA approval is about, to to keep babies on the back is what we got um, medical device approval for, because we know that if they stay on the back, they'll be safer. But sure, people who, you know, engineers that could have worked for any large company and worked for large companies in the past said, you know what, you know, this is a little company, I'm taking a, taking a chance, but it feels right and it feels like something that I can be proud of, I can share with my family and my friends and say, this is what I'm doing in the world besides the challenges of engineering and the challenges of operations and the challenges of marketing, I feel like I am, am doing something to make the world a better place. So that's been a, and a fun part of team building. For sure. And you're, you're building a legacy um, and you're, these, these people in your organization are part of that legacy. So let's now, now we're going to cut to sort of the future. So you've done this. One thing that people don't know is that you also lobby. You you have impacted laws, bills relative to, you know, children's well-being. Talk about that piece, because that's a piece people may not know about that you actually do as well. Well, an interesting thing about pediatricians is we deal with the social welfare. It starts with a family. It starts with a child and then a family. But it's those, you know, those Russian dolls that have a doll within a doll within a doll. Yeah. That's the world we live in. And pediatricians just characteristically go into areas of public health and broader community health because that's the way we're, we're trained. Um, and so I've always been involved in environmental health. And I've been lucky enough to, to be a participant and an influencer in terms of um, some some um, laws and some policies that help to protect children's environmental health. And now larger, I'm very interested in issues of postpartum depression, of course, uh, SIDS and infant death, um, but m more to the point about um, strengthening parenting and strengthening the American family. Um, I've been very lucky to, even though I've protested more wars than I can tell you during my <laughs> during my time, I'm incredibly appreciative of the dedication and the sacrifice of our military folks. And uh, I've been lucky enough to travel to about a dozen military bases across the world and work with the families there and the professionals to give support to families that are doing so much to protect us. Um, by working with inner city families and free clinics, that's always been a part of my background. And that's why I said the go our goal is that everyone gets this incredible robotic device, this incredible responsive baby bed that's going to sleep train their babies and protect them for free. So thousands of people already get a free six-month rental through their employer, through JP Morgan and Snapchat and Under Armour and Activision Blizzard. And uh, we just signed up the National Air Traffic Controllers Union because you don't want air traffic wow. controllers being tired on the job. <laughs> no. Um, but truckers and teachers and all sorts of, of individuals are getting this for free now, and insurance companies will come on board, and then ultimately the government yeah, will that's, sponsor that's this. That's where I was gonna. That's where I was gonna go. Do the carriers such as like the Aetna's, United Healthcare, Blue Cross Blue right. Shield, et cetera, are they going to bring this in and and cover a piece of this relative to the insurance they provide? I think so because we now have about over twenty medical studies underway to demonstrate to the insurance companies that. Not only can they improve care, which they want to do, but they can reduce their costs by keeping people healthy. So much of healthcare is about wellness now, about prevention, and and SNU is is 
1,000% about prevention, strengthening families, but preventing bad things. So we're now at the beginning of working with the state of Virginia, and we'll be working with other state governments as well to try to improve care, not just for the well-to-do, but for everybody in our society, rich and poor, inner city, rural, everybody needs help, and they're struggling with young kids. So that's um, a big part of the process. And we're very optimistic that we are going to get this as a covered benefit, um, mm. not dissimilar to, to breast pumps. So that's that's a big part. But Michael, I want to tell you about a second part that we're excited about, which is using SNU in the hospital. And what we just published our first study showing that each bed reduces nurse labor four to five hours per day. So it wow. helps the nurses taking care of the babies because you've probably read about these nursing shortages that we have. And so we For need sure. to have innovative alternatives. Oh, that's fa that's fantastic. That That's awesome. Is there another, are you going to have another book? Is there any books coming out? I have book ideas, but that's that we have our hands full <laughs> with everything we're trying to accomplish right now. <laughs> yeah. I figured I was like, oh, there's probably going to be another book in all of that because that seems like another whole topic, some of that behavioral work that you're doing. Well, um, listen, this is a seven-day-a-week, to... uh, 16-hour-a-day job. Yeah. I mean, it's very, yeah. very, very, very engrossing. Yeah, no, that, that that's awesome. You brought that up about adults still. You know, I have to tell you, when I get on a plane and the engines start to go, I immediately fall asleep. <laughs> so I that, still, that technique still works. <laughs> Yeah. It certainly does. And a lot of adults sleep with white noise now, or they've used heavy blankets or things like that, which all imitate the womb experience. That's what I wrote about 20 years ago in The Happiest Baby on the Block. Uh, and now you can see how that's really um, entered into into common, um, uh, common adult usage in terms of trying to promote sleep. Well, yeah, well, and, and adults lack that in a major way right now. <laughs> so Harvey... We talked about investors and we've talked about VCs and, you know, finding the capital. You had several celebrities come on board who actually invested in the company. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, when I worked as a pediatrician in Los Angeles, so, you know, there's so many celebrities here. You you certainly have the opportunities to, to meet many of them on an intimate level and take care of their babies. So, um, um Lots, lots uh, of really, really interesting folks from Madonna to Michelle Pfeiffer and Pierce Brosnan, and and they're and they're all wonderful people, and they become friends. Um, but in in building the company, you know, when you can have celebrity attached to what you're doing, it raises awareness. It just helps people pay attention. Um, and so when we started the business, we we reached out, and but we said, listen, we want you to be affiliated, but we also want you to put money in. It's not like we're just going to give you free shares. We want you to be committed and have skin in the game. And so we were incredibly lucky to have folks like uh, Justin Timberlake and, and, and Jessica Biel and um, Scarlett Johansson and Gwyneth Paltrow and um, um, who else? Well, that's a I, lot already. Who else can I mention? <laughs> <laughs> no, some folks like their names that's mentioned. Some folks like, but, don't like their names mentioned. But we're, well, we're and, very, and, very but, lucky but, with but, that. But, yeah, well, the interesting thing is that they actually bought in, believed in it, and invested in it, um, and did. not just endorsed it. And that that's that says a lot about your product. They did actually. Zoe Saldana, another one. She's incredibly socially minded, and has worked with the United Nations for children's welfare. And um, we're so proud to have her as well uh, as a part. Jessica Chastain now as well as a as a member of our investor team. And what's what's useful about that is that listen, you got to get people's attention to be able to give them a message. And of course, celebrity really helps us do that. So we're deeply appreciative for all those folks who have helped us. So you ta you were talking about, you know, big companies like JP Morgan, et cetera, who have incorporated this into a benefit. Talk to us about how that works. You know, I think one of the things that the pandemic taught us is that you got to take care of your families. Um, we're a lot of young people uh, in the workforce are having children um, and they need support to be able to come back to work and maintain the workforce. It's super tough on a, especially on a small company, but really any company, um, if um, if young parents end up leaving the workforce. McKinsey did a survey saying 34 percent of women who have new babies don't return for at least a year, and that means you're losing productivity. You have to recruit and retrain. It's really challenging 
for corporations and corporations want to support people so that they come back and they're loyal. And so we provide SNU as a benefit for literally the cost of a Starbucks um, for a 24 hour caregiver or helper for the, for the family. So it helps the baby sleep an hour more. It rots and shushes babies um, to uh, reduce crying and it sleep trains babies in addition to keeping them on the back. So all of that has been very beneficial for companies. Um, as I mentioned, even hospitals now, Children's Hospital of New Orleans provides this for all of their nurses, doctors, and technicians because they want to retain their good workforce. Um, and so we're very excited about that as the first step in getting these, um, these wonderful beds to be free for parents. Um, the next step, as I mentioned, is insurance plans and then getting the government to subsidize these so everyone has the opportunity to get them for free. It definitely certainly improves work-life balance when you think about, you know, you're, exactly you're having right. a child. How, how, how long will you be away from work? Will you come back to work? Um, yeah. and, and, these, and these first six months can be pivotal for much longer because um, if you develop postpartum depression, that can be a lifetime predisposition that you have. Or marital stress can lead to a divorce because you're so stressed. Or you can't lose your baby weight and that becomes problematic for your body. Or a stress injury or an illness that turns into a long-term problem. So these first six months, if you, if you play it right, you can build wellness and health that extends well beyond six months. And if you don't play it right, you can get problems that extend well beyond that period. So you know what, Dr. Karp, it has been really awesome having you here. Um, we are so pleased that you're a Trinet customer, that we can participate in your success, participate in your story, um, and, and continue to have you expand and grow. Um, uh, I mean, you're already global. Sounds like you have a lot of new ideas uh, that you're going to bring to market, which is very exciting. Um, and I just want to thank you for taking the time. I know you're incredibly busy um, in spending oh, with us here at, at People Force. Thank you so much, Michael. I want to remind everybody that our People Force podcast by Trinet is committed to helping small and medium sized businesses and their leaders with timely and relevant business content. The People Force podcast drops new episodes every month, and we hope you continue catching our new episodes on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and rise.trinet.com. To get relevant SMB news and info, make sure you subscribe to our podcast and to our newsletter at trinet.com backslash insights.